For IB Biology, the internal assessment, or the IA, is a major component of the overall score. And it's also the component that students have the most control over. On the actual exam, there can be all kinds of different questions, maybe some that haven't been prepared for, or you're not ready for, or just have a bad test-taking day. But the IA can, can really help to improve the overall exam grade because students can prepare for the internal assessment and have ample time to be able to complete it outside of the exam window. And so in this video and other videos, I want to spend some time looking at the different components of the IA to best help students prepare and complete the internal assessment to hopefully improve their score as much as possible. And in this video, we're going to look at the evaluation portion which is the portion of the IA that assesses the extent of the student's uh, evidence and evaluation of the investigation and the results with regard to the research question and accepted scientific context. And so in this video, we'll look at what actually makes up the evaluation criterion of the internal assessment and how best to score as high as possible in that section. The first part of evaluation is the conclusion criterion. And for this portion, you need to have a detailed conclusion that's described and justified, which is really entirely relevant to the research question. And this is maybe the most important part, supported by data. And we'll talk about different groups of data or kind of different buckets of data, um, but that's really, really crucial that you actually use data to support your research question. Um, and so we'll talk about the experimental hypothesis data, statistical data, and then also measurement uncertainty. The first part that you need to do for the conclusion, conclusion is restate the hypothesis. You've previously written a hypothesis for the experiment, and so you first just need to restate the hypothesis. And do so uh, in the format of the, ex the experimental hypothesis was da da da. Um, and then the second part, then the follow-up to that is use data to actually assess is the hypothesis supported or is it not supported. And it's important to remember that a single experiment is never going to prove or disprove a hypothesis or really anything for that matter. It takes lots of experiment and lots of collection of data to be able to uh, answer a hypothesis. So, so rather the, the term to use that's appropriate is that the data supports a hypothesis or the, the data does not support the hypothesis. Um, and in, in the follow-up to that then is to actually use data to justify your explanation of the hypothesis, whether it's supported or not. Use the experimental data, the results, the averages that, that are calculated to be able to make that decision and, and state that so for all of the conditions that are, are assessed in your overall hypothesis. Um, this, the, I guess, third part then should be to really explain the results. Uh, what did you observe? Uh, how did those results, those observations take place? And here is where you would want to include the comparison to the accepted scientific context. And we'll talk about that in our next slide. Um, but that would be a good place to do so after you've addressed the hypothesis, whether or not it's supported, and then use some data to support that decision discuss that and compare that to the accepted scientific content. The next component of the conclusion that we want to discuss is statistical data. And in this portion, we're, we're trying to assess the quality and the precision of the data that's collected. But before we discuss those, we need to distinguish between experimental and statistical data. In the course of the experiment, you collect data, uh, preferably, hopefully, multiple trials and calculate an average and then use those values, that experimental data that's collected, to then do some additional statistical tests. The experimental data are all of those raw pieces of data that's collected that then you would use to calculate some averages. The statistical data then is kind of a separate set in which you are assessing the quality and the precision of the data from the experiment. So the statistical data and experimental data are kind of two separate buckets or two separate categories. And it's really important to do the statistical data to see and to make decisions uh, as to whether or not your experimental data can be trusted. Is it precise? Is it quality data? And in doing so, it's important to remember the difference between precision and accuracy. Typically in experiments that are done for IB Bio, uh, Accuracy maybe could be discussed and compared, but it's probably going to require some comparison to uh, some published value, some accepted context value for whatever the experiment is, and typically those may not be available or may be difficult to find. Rather, and instead, 
What we can compare to is our precision. And that's what we want to use our statistical data for, is to look at, is our data that we've collected, is it precise? And so on the, the slide here, we've got a comparison of precise and accurate. Precise would be like throwing darts at a dartboard and hitting the same spot every time. Maybe not the bullseye, but the same spot. That's precise. Or as accurate would be maybe not hitting the exact same spot, but hitting the bullseye or very close to the bullseye each time. And ideally, if you're playing darts, then it would be both precise and accurate to hit the bullseye every time. When discussing statistical data, it's then important to describe what statistical tests are actually being done. And typically this is going to include uh, average, but more importantly, standard deviation, uh, standard error of the mean, and then the 95% confidence interval so we can have some measurements of precision. Standard deviation and 95% confidence interval are tools that we can use to help us decide how precise is the data that's actually collected. Other statistical tools that uh, could be included would be a t-test, that might be something that could be done, uh, a chi-squared test, as well as on some graphs doing a correlation test and, and obtaining an r-squared value to be able to uh, assess a correlation between some numerical values. Potentially also this could include an ANOVA test as well. Um, so, so those would be some different types of statistical tests. In this portion of the conclusion, you need to describe what tests are done why they were done, and then also what can they indicate about your data. The follow-up to that then is to use actual results from your statistical tests. So let's pretend that I do standard deviation and then I calculate 95% confidence interval. I need to present those values that I've collected to make some decisions about the precision of the data. And in your conclusion, you should discuss what tests were done, what they can indicate, and then what do they actually indicate about your data from the experiment. Is your data precise? Is it trustworthy? Is it quality? The last portion of the conclusion section is the assessment of measurement uncertainty. And this ties into the analysis criterion, which is discussed in another video. Uh, but measurement uncertainty really focuses on each time you take a measurement, there's going to be a bit of uncertainty in that measurement. And if you were to take a measurement 10 times, then probably maybe each of those 10 different times you're going to have a slightly different measurement. And this is even more so for an analog measurement like using a ruler versus a digital measurement like using a digital scale. And so in the conclusion, uh, after discussing the statistical data, you need to, and it's important to present the measurement uncertainty for any measurements that are conducted during the experiment, and then to discuss whether or not those measurement uncertainties could affect the precision of the data that's collected. Most often and most likely, that measurement uncertainty is probably not going to really have a big impact on the precision of the data that's collected, but it's still important to present it and to at least discuss whether or not it did have an impact on the precision of the data. Previously, I mentioned the comparison to scientific context, and here we'll, we'll follow up with that portion. In discussing your results, you should really compare what you obtained uh, and found from your experiment and the data that's collected with what do we know in the biology and the scientific community. And there's some different quality um, uh, sources that you could use. Uh, the best source and the primary source would be results from an actually published uh, research article. And these can be most easily obtained and I would encourage you to use Google Scholar. Uh, it's like Google but just for published journal articles and you can search for different topics and uh, concepts and find research articles that are associated with a particular topic for the lab that's being investigated. That's the best uh, source for this comparison to scientific context. Additionally, also secondary would be like a textbook, like the Campbell Biology textbook is the, core, uh, the textbook that, that I use in my class, and that would be also a suitable source that you could use. You want to stay away from just generalized websites that um, don't have a lot of scientific background or uh, uh, justification. Um, Nature or science.com, those would be websites that would be suitable, but really the best source to use is a published journal article. And what you want to do in this context is compare again what you found in your experiments to what other scientists have found associated with this context or, or this concept and apply your findings to other findings and associated topics. The second half of the evaluation criterion is focused on the strengths and the weaknesses. And the first part of that is focusing on the strengths. Um, and, and this is where we want to look at uh, specifically with the procedure or the method, 
what were the things that went well, and then what were the things that uh, limited the ability to collect precise data, and how might we fix them? Um, and so for strengths, we want to ident identify aspects of the experiment that enabled or allowed for the collection of precise and quality data. What parts of the procedure allowed that to take place? Um, and so that's pretty straightforward, that uh, look through the procedure and identify and think about what parts worked well and allowed really precise data to be collected. Uh, an example of that would be using a digital scale to uh, take a measurement uh, of a ch for a change in mass. That would be something that would allow for, the uh, for, for precise data to be collected. The second part of this, uh, and maybe the little bit more difficult part, is the weaknesses part. And this would be something that is focused on what are the issues with the procedure that limit the ability to collect precise data. Um, and so what you want to do is look through the procedure and think about what parts of the procedure didn't allow for quality data to be collected. Um, and this is very different than a human error. Procedural error versus human error is a common misunderstanding and a common mistake um, distinguishing between the two. And so a human error would be, uh, I've got pictures of beakers here, and that would be like, oops, I added uh, a couple hundred extra milliliters of water to my beaker when I was only supposed to add 300 milliliters of water. Um, if the procedure said to add 300 milliliters of water and I accidentally add too much, that's a human error. That's a mistake that I have made that's, that's human. Uh, it's not a procedure error because the procedure specifically, in our example, is stating how much liquid water to add to the beaker. And so that's not an example of a procedural error. Typically, if things are left um, uh, too long uh, or a time expires um, or too much of something is added, that would be an example of a human error. A procedural error is going to be something that's incorrect or difficult in the procedure, is wrong in the procedure, and really doesn't allow the collection of precise quality data. And for example, in my course, in my class, uh, to look at surface area to volume ratio, um, we do a lab where we make some uh, model cells out of auger and put them into um, an ammonia solution uh, that reacts with phenolphthalein that's in the auger to, to change colors. And when we cut our cubes, we make little cubes to be model cells, we use uh, plastic butter knives. And they're really not very good at being able to cut specific exact measurements for a one by one by one centimeter cube or, or whatever our size is. Uh, dental floss would probably work much better and be a better way to be able to cut those cubes. And so in that lab, uh, the, the procedural error is using the butter knife. It's not very precise. It doesn't allow for very specific measurements to be made. And so that would be the procedural error. And the second part then to this is the how, how do we fix these procedural errors? How do they, they be improved? And in order to do that, then you have to identify what is the procedural error and then also identify and discuss how might that be fixed. And so in my example with the model auger cubes, using dental floss would be a way to improve that specific procedural error. Um, Typically, you want to be extremely thorough in identification of your procedural errors and then how to, to correct them, uh, the improvements for them. Um, really trying to be as thorough as possible is, is really essential to, to scoring well in this particular section um, in order to make improvements. The last part uh, that's not necessarily tied to the evaluation rubric, um, but I think is worth mentioning here, is the inclusion of an appendix. And the appendix is the kind of extra material that's associated with the lab but doesn't need to be in the main body of the report. And typically things that you're going to have in the appendix would be a works cited or a bibliography, uh, uh, all of the raw data like I've listed here in the picture, uh, your sample calculations that you do for your actual um, calculations of, of standard deviation, for example, or SEM, standard error of the mean, 95% confidence interval, as well as any images or diagrams of the experimental setup that should be included. The appendix is a great place to include those and uh, is where those items should be included. Hopefully this has provided an outline of all of the different components of the evaluation criterion to help you to be as most successful as possible in scoring as high as possible in this particular aspect of the IV Biology Internal Assessment.